installment of the 11th annual McCarthy Lecture Series. And the, the person who's head of the lecture series is also giving a lecture tonight, so I didn't feel it was right to make him introduce himself, which would be, <laughs> uh, it would be what it would be. Uh, the Dale Center thanks you all for being here tonight. And I would like to begin by announcing a few upcoming events that we have on the docket. Uh, next Tuesday, September 15th, this same room, this same time, 6 p.m. Uh, we have our last McCarthy speaker for the fall. That's our own Colonel Wade Manson, one of the great friends of the Dale Center. Um, a Marine veteran of the Vietnam War. We'll begin to speak on Vietnam, a war in search of a strategy, something I'm certainly looking forward to because I want to see what strategy he comes up with uh, that, that, that would have been the right one. Um, also on September 17th, the Dale Center is screening some movie called The Brothers in War. Uh, it's up for an Emmy. It's actually a, a based on my book, Boys of 67, Charlie Company's War in Vietnam. Uh, the Emmy uh, ceremony is uh, set up there. Wait, hey, wait. So now Wade will be speaking uh, next, uh, next week. Um, uh, the, the Emmys are the 28th of September in, in New York, and I'll be there with a necktie. And if, the, for those of you who know me, that says how important it is that I'll have a, a necktie on. Um, there'll also be a book signing associated with that. The festivities kick off here in the foyer at uh, uh, 5 o'clock, and the movie will uh, start at 6, and there'll be uh, books on sale, and print, print books you've already gotten, and also uh, something that'll be really interesting about that is John Young, who's one of the, he was the inspiration for the book. If you've been in my Vietnam War class, you know how integral he is to that class, and his story is one that is uh, spellbinding, and he himself is personally mesmerizing. He'll be there uh, to take questions for the sign book. It's in uh, LAB 108, also known as Gonzales Auditorium. Uh, the, light, the book signing starts, yes, in this building. Uh, the book signing starts at 5, so we'll be milling around at 5, a little reception uh, for that as well, and then we'll migrate into the uh, to room 108 for the movie and for the uh, question and answer session. Uh, Tuesday, October 13th at 6 p.m. is our next Warren Society Roundtable discussion. Uh, on Rebels With and Without a Cause. It's at the local Hasbro Public Library down past the graveyard, if you don't know where that is, now you do. Uh, Dr. Lee Follett will be discussing uh, a book, Robin Hood by J.C. Holt. No. Oh. That's October. That's October. That's October. Yeah, that's October. The, the, when's the next? T tomorrow. 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 Right. Yeah. Okay, tomorrow, that's right. Tomorrow, <laughs> Kyle is doing, uh, hang on, some Wh stuff. Wh Wednesday. 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 Wednesday.
so tonight I'm going to be talking, well, it's about the ongoing research that I've been doing for the current book project, which is well underway, and also sort of, you know, how I spent Buck Month money this summer. <laughs> so, you know, get to see photos and things of places I went to, I'll talk a little bit about some of the archives that I visited um, without getting too technical because no one other than these people want to hear a lot about archives. But, um, but I will talk a little bit about the historical sources and their significance in allowing us to get at, you know, the experience of war from the perspective of a variety of different people in a very far away time and place, right? I mean, a lot of us know all about war in, you know, the abstract, some of us know about it in the specific and have been there, but, you know, the wars we tend to know the most about or hear the most about, of course, are modern wars, right? Wars for which you have television or video or radio or something like that, you know, much, you know, much more recent conflicts. And one of the real rewards of working on this project has been able to go back uh, 350 years and really get a sense of how people in the 17th century in China experienced, remembered, and talked about war and the experience of war. And how you know, their culture also sort of influenced how they understood these events, and how they remembered these events, commemorated them, and how they still sort of play out today. And how even you know, conflicts that were hundreds of years old were for the Chinese and um, you know they can they can come back and still you know ordinary people would know about this stuff. TV programs, movies, video games, etc., are based around some of these events I'm going to be talking about today, and um, you know, hopefully getting giving you a little insight into uh, 17th century China, but also how that kind of relates to uh, war and society more broadly. So uh, ordinary people. So we start out with a quote from one of my primary sources, and this actually is a quote that this particular author who survived these events, this is how he starts his book of accounts of uh, warfare in China in the 17th century. In many ways, right, it's very Chinese, right? Chaos is not born from chaos. It is born from order. Order is not born from order, but is born out of chaos. Without great chaos, one cannot have great order. Either one or the other. Right, we're already getting Chinese, right? It's yin and it's yang. It's this and it's that. And, um, and the sources are full of this kind of stuff. And it's interesting because some of them, when you read the, the primary sources themselves, they sort of, the lesson they tell is, okay, well, we had to go through this so that the new government could bring order. Others will blame the new government for creating the disorder. And that's one of the real interesting things about doing this project is that the, the major combatants, both sides produce documents. And so you, you have often very different perspectives on the same events written from the side of either the Manchu conquerors, the uh, Qing, or from the Ming royalists who are fighting the Manchu. And we'll talk more about that uh, in just a second. But first, a fun way to sort of get into the, the idea of what was going on. So we'll start with a few key dates, which are will be on the test. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end, we'll come back to this. And um, this will just kind of bracket the entire scope of what the current book project is. And for me, it's sort of interesting because now this is my third, you know, sort of independent monograph. And the first one, you know, was written in the 1590s, then I jumped ahead, and now again. And they're all sequels in some way, like the two second books. This is a sequel, a direct sequel to the last book I wrote. And that one was a sequel to the first one. So for me, it's fun because some of the same characters are involved from the different books. Or their sons or grandsons are involved. So it's really like this epic. Uh, oh, yeah, that guy's the grandson of so-and-so. He, he died off. So you've got this real sort of you know Star Wars trilogy feel to all of this, um, and which, which at least for me it, it's it's fun, um, and to see how these people keep coming back and you know sort of and, and how they actually make reference to things that had happened before, um, and so the in the dates that I'm looking at here in the current project it's about a 20 year span of time starting in 1644 and going until the 1660s, and I'm going to show you a map in a second so you don't have to try to figure out where all the <coughs> Beijing, which was the capital of the Ming Dynasty, uh, fell in April of 1644. Um, it had been under pressure from uh, the Northeast, from people called the Manchu, who you're probably familiar with. Um, you know, and they had been fighting the Ming off and on since the teens and 1618s. But it actually falls to a peasant rebel, a guy named uh, Li Zicheng, uh, more popularly known as the Dashing Prince. And uh, you'll see an image of him in a second. But he actually captures the uh, city in, in April of 
Lord will help from the inside. The last emperor of the Ming Dynasty decides that at this point he had, he had had chances to escape. He decides to go down to the city, takes himself out after calling a conference, which nobody showed up for. He calls a meeting, nobody shows up. As a rebel, he's taking the city. What do we do? No one's there. So he, um, he does what a lot of us would do in this situation. He gets really drunk. Um, and then he, uh, then he calls his wife up and he goes, well, you know what you got to do? And she's like, yep, I've got to kill myself. So his wife hangs herself. He then attempts to kill his two daughters so that they are now raped by the peasant rebels when they take the city. He manages to kill one. The other, he only manages to cut her arm off and leaves her bleeding on the floor of the palace where she was later found by the peasant rebels and they took care of her. She became a Buddhist nun. It was all good. Um, <laughs> his two sons were sent off into hiding. So his, his surviving sons sent into hiding. He went back to Longevity Hill behind the Forbidden City and hung himself. Um, you can still see the tree where he hung himself mm -hmm. today. Um, but the present rebels take the city, but they don't hold it for very long because in the meanwhile, the Manchus are coming from the northeast. They cut a deal with the Chinese general at the border who, um, who was angry at the uh, peasant rebels who had off also offered him a deal but had made the mistake of capturing his girlfriend. And um, this upset him somewhat, so he throws in his lot with the Manchus and they quickly drive the peasants out of Beijing and they will take it in June. So the peasant rebel Liu Zicheng is <coughs> defeated but still alive. And so he will establish himself in South China or West China at the last second. Meanwhile, the Ming court had a variety of princes who were nephews and stuff of the last emperor. They set up a rival regime in the southern city of Nanjing to contest the Manchus. Another peasant rebel, the main guy I'm going to be talking about tonight, uh, better known by his nickname, and he used to call John Shenzhou, but his nickname was the Yellow Tiger, um, also called the Eighth Great King, also known as the Butcher of Sichuan. Um, we'll talk about that more later. But um, so he sets up his own regime in Sichuan province, and so now you've got you know, essentially three, four regimes going around. You've got a southern Ming regime, you've got the Manchus in Beijing, got a former peasant rebel leader in West China, you've got another peasant rebel leader in South China, and a variety of princes and others running around um, in, in South and Central China, including a pirate loyalist who operates off the coast, who is half Japanese and half Chinese, and he just you know, survives more than anyone. So it's very much, if you're familiar with the show Game of Thrones, it's like Game of Thrones without all the gentility. <laughs> but you have, you have you know, multiple claimants, you have dwarf sorcerers, you have people that flay other people alive. You have, you have children running back and forth. You have pretenders. It's very, very fascinating, actually, to see what's going on. And then you have a, a series of resistance movements, which, which I'm going to talk about tonight, in the Southwest. Once the uh, initial Ming regime falls in Nanjing, it only lasts a year, the, the city is captured and the Manchus are pushed south. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. So it gives you some key dates. I'm, I'm focusing mostly on you know, this. Chinese romance, but um, but so here's the Great Wall up here, see what it is right there, um, and amazingly enough, right, you look at this map and what's not on it? Beijing. Um, <laughs> so, but anyhow, Beijing is, uh, let's see, I've got the same thing up here, so Beijing is up here, pretty close to the Great Wall. Um, but um, the main area that I'm studying for this book project is down here, this is southwest China. And this is where the, uh, the Ming loyalist movement will eventually retreat to in the 1650s and into the 60s. So you can see geographically, you know, it's down here. But it's very far to the southwest, you know, hundreds of miles from the capital. And this part of the country is extremely rugged. <coughs> You'll see some pictures later today. Lots of bamboo forests, mountains, gorges, rivers. It's very rough terrain. And for the Manchus, who are nomadic conquerors from the, from the, from the Central Asia and the Northeast, for their horses and style of warfare, it's very difficult to get down in here and fight. And so it became a good base for, uh, for the Ming to resist there. And then it can continue falling back into the rugged territory of the Southwest area. So I'm going to talk a lot about the city of Chengdu, which I'm going to set up a kingdom. In terms of the Ming Qing transition in, dynasty, in Chinese history, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk more generally here and then get into specifics a little bit later, but uh, significance. Well, there, you know, Imperial China goes back to 200 BC, so there are always these dynastic transitions, you know, one state to another. The Ming Qing transition is especially important for a number of reasons. For one, obviously, it's the last traditional dynastic transition. It happens 
from the 1640s through the 1680s. So, um, and so in that sense, it's very important. Um, it's also because of that, partly because of that, it's the best document of all the dynastic transitions. We have far more records from this dynastic transition than anyone before, because there were plenty of people writing about it, and there were plenty <coughs> of people literate. And that's part of the, the sort of background here, is that you know, there was a, a pretty high literacy rates in the Ming, maybe up to 50% of the male population. Sounds low, but when you're talking about 1600, that's a tremendously high literacy rate. Um, and so a lot of books survived. There was a widespread printing culture. And so you know, sons, grandsons preserved these accounts, officials wrote these accounts. And it was a heavily bureaucratized state. So everybody's writing these reports, these after, we would call them after action reports now. But they're essentially these officials for the Manchu side are writing what they did. And it's fascinating for those of you who say study Vietnam to see this account of like, we went in here, we took out this village, we killed 300 bandits, we captured 49 horses, 38 donkeys, 700 sets of armor. And they have like all these little statistics to show what kind of progress they're making. Very much, you know, and how many heads we took, how many commanders we killed. Therefore, this area has now been secured and pacified. And then they will move on to the next village. And then you'll read an account from a few months later and they're like, yeah, um, well, the bandits have uh, sprung up again, you know, in this area, and um, you know, and it's all because these locals are stirring them up and they don't understand righteousness, and um, and then people are taking seals from each other because they're all these rival governments. So people are like, okay, I'll become a general under you, I'll become an officer under you, and so the the legitimate government, depending on your perspective, is always trying to get these seals, these titles of office, from the other people. And they always say that when they capture a city, we capture four false seals and four false generals like that because this is a marker of status. And so reading the account is really interesting to see that and in terms of how they define legitimacy. Um, so the dynastic transition is significant for that. Also because of the detail we have and, and information on you know, what was going on in China chronicologically, ecologically, in terms of you know, demographic shifts and things, we have a lot of information. As some people know, this period in world history is considered the World Ice Age, the poor crop harvest, a lot of natural disasters records from China help confirm what other historians have found in other parts of the world. So it's significant in that respect. Also, which makes it really important later and even into the modern era, is the fact that the Manchus right, were foreign conquerors. So the, the Ming, who were the defending dynasty, they were native Han Chinese. And so this becomes an issue of saving China from foreign aggression. And so in the modern period, the communists make a lot of this. You know, Even though the Manchus are one of the recognized minorities of China, they often, in the 60s and 70s, 50s, Chinese communist historians have talked about how the Chinese people united against foreign aggression. And, um, and of course, you know, going back to last week's talk, the foreign aggression they're talking about is the United States. But in this case, the, the Manchus is the big bad bully who came in. And so there's a lot of interesting things that go on in terms of the historiography and in terms of how this is remembered, and that's an interesting aspect. Um, so I mentioned the social and demographic stuff. Um, the records aren't complete, but it's estimated that as much as 40% of the population dies in the 17th century. Um, I think that figure's probably a little high, um, but you know, probably t maybe 20%, 25% of the Chinese population from the around 1600 to around 1700 dies. In Sichuan province, where Zhang Xianzhong uh, reigned for several years, contemporary records claim that up to 99% of the population died. You know, 99 out of 100 homes were empty. Houses were empty, but the graves were full. You know, some of the accounts, you know, only one to two percent survived. The official history of the Ming Dynasty claims that Zhang Shenzhong killed 600 million people. Um, now, uh, that's impossible because the entire population of China was about 200 million at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't have killed him three times over. Um, you know, more accurate, I, th I think that's a decimal error, it's probably 600,000 which would make sense because the population of the Sichuan province is about four million, so that's about a sixth of the population. That's a figure that I can, I can accept. I mean, it's a lot, but it's still, it's still plausible, and I'll talk more about its excesses in, in a bit. But so you get a lot of information about social and demographic changes and how this affected China, and also later colonization efforts and expansion efforts. The Manchu dynasty, when it finally succeeds, expands territories way to the south and west, far more than any dynasty ever had before. So the borders you see from China today are essentially the Manchu border. Right? That's what they conquered after they wiped out the Ming. And then 
incorporated the Tibetans and the Mongols and all these other people into what is China today. And so there's a lot of sort of implications of that too. Um, and so historiographically, you've got this foreigner versus native thing. You've also got in the Chinese writing in the 20th century, a lot of interest in the peasant rebels. You know, it's like they were peasants. You know, Mao was a peasant. And so tremendous work was done in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s studying these guys as peasant heroes. And so while in traditional historiography they were often attacked for being as this being you know vicious and, and cruel and corrupt and all these other things, in the Chinese communist rendering of things, these guys are heroes. And they should be understood as heroes. And so statues are erected, books are written, things are, are would have come out about them. And um, so that's very interesting in a uh, in a you know contemporary sense. Likewise in the notion of memory, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a lot of uh, popular memories about the Ming transition, a lot of TV programs today, historians over there go on these TV shows, they write best-selling books about the Ming transition and some of the people I'm gonna talk about today. And so ordinary people know about these figures, they see their statues and their memorials. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of, uh, you know, they're often you know, in the contemporary news and in the discovery. I mean, for example, in 2002, when the city government of the city of Chengdu was doing renovations to expand the city, they discovered a grave, a mass grave in the outskirts of the city. And so the news started saying, a 10,000 person grave found on the outskirts of Chengdu. And so they started doing some more digging, some excavating, and they eventually determined that those graves were from this period. They were from the 1640s and 50s. And they were from some massacre. It wasn't, it wasn't clear who did it, if it was the peasant rebel Zhang Shenzhong or generals, one of the Qing generals, couldn't, couldn't figure it out for sure. But the, the bodies were strewn about, some of them you know, had hands or legs missing, you know, clearly you know, massive, you know, massacre and, uh, that had been done, and this was you know, made, made popular news, and it you know, led <coughs> to a sort of idea of uh, you know, the, the devastation wrecked in this period of Sichuan province in particular. And, um, and just even, even building on that, scholars at the time, in, interestingly enough, even in kind of legitimate historical sources, sometimes went for the lurid, went for the, uh, you know, trying to make the buck or whatever, I don't know, who besides me is buying you know, Ming sources. But, um, <laughs> but so this is a book, uh, this is a book published that year in 2002 in Sichuan province in Chengdu in the city where they found this grave. So I have no idea if it was because of that that they decided to do this. But as you can see, it's uh, called Zhang Qianzhong's Massacres of Sichuan. This is a veritable account, the true records Zhang Shenzhong's Massacres of Sichuan. These are all primary sources, and um, you know, from the 17th century. But as you can see here, if you can make it out, I don't know how, you know, much, you know, well you can see. But Sichuan, was, it means four rivers in Chinese. That's the name of the province. But you can see the Sichuan, like it turns into a river of blood on the cover here. So, uh, so Sichuan, a river flows in blood. And they talk about this in the primary accounts. They say things like, the roads were filled with bones. For 70 li, which is about 30 miles outside the capital city, there were nothing but rotting corpses. And, um, and then the river was full of blood so much that you couldn't even eat fish or anything out of the river. And they talk about these, these, uh, these accounts. And then in the, um, on the back of the book, it says the eight great kings, which refers to Zhang Shenzhong, says, massacred the people of Sichuan. And then the next one is the, the 13 houses, which is another rebel group, covered the capital in blood. And so, you know, this is a this is a primary source account, right? I mean, but it really, you know, got me to buy it. Um, so, so I, I guess it's it's working, right? Um, but but yeah, that's part of the popular memory. When I was in Sichuan just a few weeks ago, talking about this project with locals, and you know, not everybody knew of Zhang Shenzhong today, but there were a few guys, including this cabbie, who's like, why do you want to study that guy? You, you know, he hated us all. He wanted to kill us all because he was from another province. Wanted to execute all the people of Sichuan. And he goes. I, let me tell you a local story about him. And so this is my cab driver. And he's like, you know, he's, he goes, well, you, you won't be offended, will you? And I'm like, no, no, tell me the story. And of course, it's in Chinese, so I'm only getting some of it. And my wife is helping me tra help him translate. But apparently when he was in Sichuan, he was tra in this village where we were researching. He, was, he, was, he had to uh, go off and relieve himself in the bushes. And he forgot to bring paper with him. So he took some, some, some plants or something and then you know, cleaned himself up a bit. And he got scratched and hurt himself. And he goes, man, he goes, even the plants in this place are vicious. <laughs> the people are even worse.
farms. No wonder I have to kill them all. <laughs> and so it was part of a local story about him. So, um, so you know, popular culture, these guys are, are well regarded, or at least, at least known about, if not always honored. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any other image here. So this is the dashing prince. This is from a popular uh, kids' account. Uh, these are showing the, the peasant where he takes Beijing. That, uh, that banner is dashing. You know, that was his nickname, the Tron Long. He promised to, uh, you know, I know it's election year coming up. One of the things he promised when he became king, he was going to cancel all taxes. <laughs> and the peasants were going to have plenty to eat. And so there were all these rhymes about him, you know, when, you, when the dashing prince comes, you'll no longer pay taxes. They open prisons and release people to join him. He, incidentally, was a laid off postal worker. And, uh, so the government cut the postal service. <coughs> he started the rebellion. And uh, that was sort of his background. Um, he had been a soldier before. And, um, and so you can see him there. And he, you know, he was a dashing figure, very austere in his personal habits. He lost an eye in a siege of a city. He got taken out by an arrow. So sometimes he had an eye patch. His sidekick was a dwarf sorcerer and fortune teller. So he was a very colorful character still well regarded in China today. As I said, this is a children's book, but I'll show you a couple of other uh, images in a second. Uh, this is Richard Lee Butcher, and his followers uh, you know, continue to be very prominent uh, later. <coughs> uh, this is the other guy. This is John Shandong, the Yellow Tiger, the Eight Great King, as they're called. And so that, that's a John, that's a surname. You can see the big beard here. And again, on a white horse. This is part of a set of portraits of the, of the military museum of Beijing, the official military museum and there are portraits of the two of these guys next to each other. Um, and uh, that, that Lee picture wasn't the one from the fair. You can see the fire from the back. Yeah. And he, his reputation is not as good as Lee's uh, because he was, he was insane. <laughs> and um, and was, was a really vicious guy. Um, in his official biography, they say uh, he liked killing people. And, and from the time he was young, he was vicious and cruel. And if a day went by and he didn't kill someone, then he was in a really bad mood. <laughs> and, um, and so there are a lot of stories like this, although there are other stories I read in some of these folktale accounts of him like saving a little girl from a disease. And he had a kind heart, it was just the evil landlords and gentry that he hated, the, the, the Confucian scholars, because they oppressed the people. But, um, but he, you know, one of the other key figures of, of that was in the Jin of Dao Zhang. So, yeah. um, now here's, a, here's a statue of Li Zichang. along the route that he entered the city from. So to him and he leaves, always got the big cape. Okay. Uh, nice and hoarse. And he's actually, he, he's eventually killed by a peasant mob uh, for stealing food in central China. When, the Qing, when he's on the run, he breaks away from his troops and he gets caught stealing food in a village and they kill him and present his head to the Manchus. Supposedly, other versions say he lived and became a Buddhist monk and was hiding out in the countryside. But his followers are around for another 20 years, <coughs> just like adopted sons. And this is just another one. Sorry, the picture, this is my photo, and it's not clear because I was in a bus, like going 70 miles an hour down the freeway when I took it. So, um, so some of the images aren't as clear as I'd like to, as I would like. But um, so in terms of like what we know about these guys, and you're going to hear some accounts of some of these things in a second, I just want to say a few things about the historical sources themselves. Um, we've got a variety of different things. I mean, this is what we do as historians. We've got official histories and government chronicles. And so these were compiled by people who were in charge of either suppressing the, the rebels, the resistors, the Manchu rule, or in some cases working for the Ming loyalist governments. Uh, most of what we have are the Qing accounts. And so it's interesting. They, they always talk about bandits, rebels, you know, disloyal subjects, and how they deluded the people and you know, didn't allow them to come to allegiance to submission proper Manchu government. And on the other side, you've got the Manchu invaders, the barbarians, the uh, you know uncouth invaders, the hackers, these sorts of things. Um, so you've got these official histories and these government chronicles. And they're, they're you know, very detailed, and they've got a lot of information. And this is where, as a military historian, you can get your information on you know, how much did, you know, did rice cost at a certain time? How many uniforms did it cost? What was the cost of building boats? How many 
boats did they need to transport X number of troops? How many horses did they need? And so you get these really, really detailed counts. And these officials always, you know, basically trying to cover their rear ends about why they failed and stuff. But you know, sort of like sort of the way they write, you can kind of tell, okay, this wasn't really a successful operation. But the way they make it seem, yes, then they put the rebels to the run. But then somebody incited them again. And, um, and it's very interesting to read these accounts. And sometimes they're very matter of fact. I'm going to read a couple later for you. Um, but they're, they're pretty interesting just to get the, in memorials, they're, they're basically reports to the emperor, or to various elements of the bureaucracy. And so they've often got a standard form, and it'd be like, I am in the field, I am such and such. This is my position, you know, supreme commander of the three provinces, in charge of great transport, bandit suppression, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, you know, present this to the Ministry of War, blah, blah, blah. And so you've got these <coughs> kind of very, you know, bureaucratized reports. Um, some of the most interesting ones are the private histories and memoirs. These are written by people who either work, sometimes they work for the government, sometimes it was compiled by the children or grandchildren of those who survived these events. Sometimes they're just diaries. Sometimes we're not really sure you know, who the guy was even, they have pseudonyms and what they were doing, but they, they've also got you know, much detailed local information. So they'll get information of what happened at the, you know, at the provincial level, at the village level. And it's amazing that we know all sorts of there. I, I've been tracking them down all summer. So like different cities, you can say, okay, this was going on here, this was going on here. This is what this guy saw, this is what this guy saw. And you know, providing you know, extreme levels of detail about your know, government, about local policies, about individuals. And so those are pretty interesting, the memoirs as well. One of the fascinating things from a global perspective is that you've got accounts by Jesuit missionaries who were in China at the time. And so some of them were at the Manchu court trying to convert the Manchus. There were those who were advisors to the Ming and the Jesuits um, were highly valued for their technical and scientific knowledge, more so than for being Catholic, and because they were experts at casting cannon. And so the Chinese love the canonical knowledge they can bring. Um, and so there were a lot of Jesuits that were employed as cannon you know, manufacturers. And actually there were two of them who were at the court of Zhang Quanzhong, who got captured essentially when he took the city of Chengdu, and they were stuck there. They had been trying to get missionary support in Sichuan, and they wrote a diary at their time under his rule. And it's fantastic because the other source is you've got, you know, what these group of Chinese people say, what the Manchus say, and you know, what do we what really happened? Well, the Jesuits are, we presume that they're more, you know, neutral in all this. And they talk about John's good points, and there were a few, I guess. And and they talk about his bad points. So it's a fascinating source because you've got these Westerners in China in the sixteen hundreds. And I was lucky enough to be able to read their diary because Originals in Portuguese, and it's held in the Vatican. Um, but I found out through various channels that the University of San Francisco, the Vichy Institute, had a translated a manuscript translated into English of it. And I was able to go to the University of San Francisco this summer and read it. And you know, it's 120 pages long in English, which you know, my, my English is pretty good. So, <laughs> uh, so I was able to read it and understand it, and then bring that you know bring that source into the study of all these Chinese. We've got that, and then we've got folklore like I was talking about before. I mean, that was one of the classic stories is the um, you know, Zhang Xuanzong story. But then other stories from some of these chronicles about what happened to people. I mean, there's, there's one account that says, you know, things got so bad that people went off into the wilderness, and some people, they became feral and animal-like, and they grew coats of white fur, and they would ambush people in the roadside and drink their blood. And, um, you know, it's just really interesting sort of stories. And, and when doing that research, I had, you know, done some other, you know, reading on my own about, um, you know, literature pertaining to other, you know, wild people and people going feral. And, and the Sasquatch literature, some of the Native American tribes talk about the Sasquatch as being Native Americans that have gone feral. And the sort of descriptions of them are very similar to these descriptions of the Chinese wild men, other, what, what happened to these people in China. Another one said some people took to living in the trees and they could almost glide from branch to branch because they just stayed up high when bandits couldn't get them. Um, and so it's pretty interesting to get some of these folklore accounts in addition to some of the tiger stuff I'm going to you know, allude to uh, later. But, uh, but yeah, here's the, here's the actual quote here. Um, Villages were empty and for hundreds of li there were no people. The subjects fled deep into the mountains. Those who could not eat to survive piled up in ravines. Some ate grass and leaves and those who were still alive became wild people, living in forests and growing coats of white fur. If they happened to meet someone along the road, they would kill them and drink their blood. And, um, you know, so, and interesting
figured it out, actually getting more scientific. Um, when I presented a version of a paper at a conference, this medical person came up to me afterwards and said, you know, growing white hair is a symbol, is, is, a, uh, is a symptom of malnutrition. And so there could actually be, I just heard that, right? And so it, there could actually be an actual medical backdrop to that story. stuff. Um, in terms of John himself, a little more discussion and we'll get into some images and then I'll get into a few more of the primary sources. You know, so he sets himself up in southwest China. His aim is to establish a kingdom there and use it as a springboard to conquer the empire. And initially at least he seems to have attempted to do this. He attempted to ameliorate some of the ills of the late Ming dynasty, collect taxes, provide some sense of law and order. He organized the people into village groups of 10, and you know, groups of 10, 100, 1,000, etc. Um, and attempted, according to the Jesuits at least, tried to establish some, some type of order. Unfortunately, within a few months of him taking over, this rival regime had been set up by the Ming Dynasty, and so all these officials decided, well, we're not going to be loyal to him, because we're old Ming officials. And so they became leading resist they started leading resistance in the countryside. And so John became very angry and started punishing the resistance. After them, you know, one by one, and um, quickly starts spreading his armies over Sichuan province and starts rewarding his men, supposedly, by the number of people they kill. And so, according to the chronicles, right, his, the, the hands and feet, because you, you turn in severed hands and feet, they piled up beside his fortress, and people would get promotions based on how many people they killed, and he would send them out. He said, Kill this many people, kill this many people, because of the, the feeling of disloyalty. He saw enemies all around him. Well, there were enemies. Some more than others. And by this point, he's got a regime. He's got the other peasant rebel. He's not dead yet. At least the Shang is still alive. He's got the Manchus. He's got the Ming. He's got four major contenders. He's got a bunch of independent power brokers who are local warlords, former generals, etc. And so these things get uh, worse and worse for John. And he starts, um, he becomes increasingly paranoid. The, uh, the sources talk about, um, they talk about him going more and more insane. And I, I don't want to go too much detail about his personal background. But he starts seeing ghosts. He's haunted by his enemies. There are headless you know, troops of musicians wandering his palace. You know, disembodied hands are grabbing food out of his mouth and stuff. Um, he hears and sees things. There are various portents uh, announcing his doom. There's a sort of prophecy about how he's going to die, which of course comes true, um, according to some of the sources. And um, so things get worse and worse for John when he starts you know, embarking upon this campaign of terror. And his favorite uh, punishment was to flay people alive. Supposedly, the walls of his palace in the outskirts are covered with the flayed skin, which is cut with flesh. Just flayed people alive outside his palace, and there would just be skins just piled up all over them. And that was a, that was a that wasn't a punishment unique to him, but certainly he became infamous for it. And um, eventually, as his enemies close in, he decides to break out of his, his sort of fastness in Sichuan, strike for the north. He decides that all the people of Sichuan were disloyal, and he has these visions that God, when he says heaven. He says, heaven told him to kill, to kill the disloyal people of Sichuan. And so he's going to do that. And um, eventually he decides to leave Sichuan province after he kills as many people as he can, flee to the north and set up a new kingdom. And he dies in route. And, um, and he's killed you know, by a Manchu prince. One of his former generals who was afraid he was going to be killed defects to the Manchus and then you know, travels hundreds of miles and says, I know exactly where John Shandong is camped and I will lead you there. And um, supposedly he does. <coughs> Kills him, his name is the same as the Chinese word for flute without the bamboo part of it. It means uh, Prince Su. So he would die by a flute without bamboo. It's a great riddle. And, uh, but uh, so, so he will eventually die there. Um, and then the legends grow up around his death. I'm going to show you his grave in a second. Supposedly a, a black tiger monster haunted his grave. And um, you know, it was a duty. He couldn't go near it. And um, various other things happened in the wake of. Images now, and as I mentioned, there's a lot of you know, folklore about it. And so when you go to Sichuan province in particular, you've got some of these. So, and this is in the, the city of Chongqing in southwest China, which is capital of World War II. And um, what they've done.
time is these are the Ming Dynasty walls, part of them. And then they, they created like an attack on the walls. And he was one of the people who took this wall at Kongyang Gate. And so they've got these you know, big metal soldiers. And it's really cool <laughs> attacking the walls. So you see these guys at the bottom. And I'll show you some of the other images on the top. Although it's not clear if they're supposed to be Zhang troops or somebody else. They've got a bunch of stories about who breached this wall. But uh, you know, these guys here. These things are like larger than that, but they're like eight feet tall. And that's the wall itself. You can see the big <coughs> building right behind it. It's the, the Ming Dynasty wall there. They're not, you know, there's a park here, but you know, there's massive you know, structures in the city. There's like eight million people. Yeah. This is now I'm on top of the wall looking down at the archers. In case somebody already got this. <laughs> but and yeah, and on top there's guys on top like rocks out on the people down here. So it's pretty neat. And so the, and then this is an, this is actually a stele which has the story of John's attack on the city. So they said he was you know peasant rebels attacking the city. And this is John himself. Big beard and crazy eye. Big spear. And so um, and so he this is actually these are coins that he created. Sichuan to try to stimulate commerce. And one of the things you have to do when you become emperor or king or whatever is you have to mint coinage <coughs> and make it official. And so these are uh, some of the coins from his reign. That's just his, that's his reign title, and that means circulating coin or crown. Kong Yang, Dashun Kong Yang. That's right, that. So he's a copper. And so he was, a, he was eventually uh, deified in, uh, in one temple outside of Chengdu. And so his deceased were statues of him. He was, he was uh, seen as an incarnation of one of the gods of literary accomplishment. Can you believe that now? <laughs> so, so, um, so, and again, he, he's got the fierce beard and he was a favorite <coughs> And his, his favorite name for himself was actually not Yellow Tiger, but it was actually the Eighth Great King. And so he, you know, maybe it was just a Buddhist term that refers to guardian deities. And so this is sort of a Buddhist guardian and proposed these striking him. This is actually, this is the view from the uh, the mountain ridge where he was buried. And so this is Sichuan province just a couple miles away. You can see the hills and the forest and stuff around it. This is his tomb. Um, I was able to take pictures of it, but nobody, none of the Chinese people with me would let me get a picture with the tomb. But they said, you can never take a picture with a grave. It is bad luck. We, we will not take your picture of this tomb. <laughs> so, um, so I was like, all right, I guess I just get a picture of the tomb. What's interesting to me is that somebody has brought an incense to him. I don't know if it's to honor him or keep him from coming back. But, uh, <laughs> but you've got the, and, and the thing is, is I was expecting something much more elaborate because I've read stuff on the internet which is totally false. So don't believe everything you read on the internet. Uh, the government maintained this site and blah, blah, blah. So after like talking to several Buddhist monks, a local police chief, and this guy who, I don't know, worked there somehow, like they finally led me through and they're like, we never leave people back here, but you're an important we're going to let you find the grave. And so these are these like, people wandering, trying to find it. And there was no way I would have found it. It's like this narrow trail. you got to go through these rock gates to get there. It's really neat. And you can't really make it out. It says Tomb of Zhang Shen Zhen. But, uh, and so there, there's me at the county archives. <laughs> <laughs> so, where I got some folklore, picked up some folklore here. And that's the, the, the People's Government of Xichun Town. So um, what essentially, and then, so what happens, and I, I, I don't have too much time, I have a little time here. After he dies, the political situation, if anything, gets worse because there are more contenders for power. And so John's four adopted sons um, become Ming, they eventually become Ming loyalist generals, defending the very dynasty they helped overthrow um, to varying degrees. Uh, you have independent warlords, so they ally with the southern nations. You have independent warlords. You have massive social breakdown and um, increasing descent of the entire Southwest into a state of slavery. And um, so I wanted to give you a full, uh, a few examples from the primary source to kind of highlight these sort of social things that were going on. So as one, um, as one scholar put it, or one contemporary, in the late being the wandering bandits arose in the four directions and their poison spread across all within the seas. 
Of all the places where the calamity spread was most dire in Sichuan. The land was red with blood for more than a thousand leagues. Um, another guy observed, the people of the former generation said when disorder had not yet erupted elsewhere in the empire, Sichuan was already in disorder. Um, when, uh, let's see, when the rest of the empire had already been brought to order, Sichuan was finally brought to order. And they said this was the worst affected part of the country in terms of the, uh, the disaster. A couple of other things <coughs> about this. Um, uh, one of the other things you read extensively is about tiger attacks. And tigers are pretty much extinct in China today. There may be a few in the southwest or up in you know, Manchuria, <coughs> the Siberian border. But at this time, there were still quite a few tigers. There are actually elephants. So in my accounts, there are a lot of real elephants, like in battle and stuff, which is pretty cool. There aren't elephants in China anymore either. Um, but there are these tigers, and there are tiger attacks all over the place. And it's interesting because some of them, they sort of model what you would know as tiger behavior. I've actually done some research on tiger behavior <laughs> for this project. Found out that the South China subspecies of tiger is considered to be the most aggressive <coughs> and the most likely to attack humans, according to you know, you know biologists. And uh, but in traditional China, the tiger could either be the the, uh, the evil beast that reflects the savagery of society, or it could be the one who writes wrongs, one who you know, wipes out people officially. It's got kind of two meanings. But um, there are a lot of accounts of tigers. Tigers in villages. Tigers you know swimming and attacking people in boats, which they do. Um, leopard attacks too. So, you know, fun fact, right? Leopards will attack a group to stick the weakest one. Tigers will generally not do that. Just if you if you got to make a choice sometimes, <laughs> you know, just kind of remember that. Uh, wolves too, lots of wolf attacks. But I'm going to give you some statistics because they're just fascinating. From this, from this is from an official report of a uh, of Kit. And here's yeah, here's here's an official report about. Um, from the pacification commissioner of Sichuan from 1650. He begins by describing Sichuan province as a den of tigers and a haven of chaos caused by the widespread bandits. And this guy works for the Manchus. So he doesn't blame the Manchus for anything. All these groups were raping, looting, and pillaging, taking food from people, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But and he says, you could go a great distance without even seeing smoke from the cooking fire. Now, nobody was cooking. In fact, one of the sources said people didn't cook because if you cooked, somebody would come to your house and eat so, so people like it. So they, they ate without cooking. Uh, that's what one of the sources said. And then it says, uh, he says only two to three percent of the population was still alive. And he says, you know, mostly it's because of the bandits, not because of the Manchus. We're trying to prevent order. But then he gives the information about the tigers. He says in one district, out of a previous population of 506, some 228 people were killed by tigers. That's a pretty high percentage, right? <laughs> Another 55 died of illness. And a lot of people are dying of malnutrition and various diseases. And it's just 223 were alive. In another place, 42 out of 74 inhabitants were eaten by tigers. <laughs> so, and he says, he says, some people were reportedly eaten by tigers in broad daylight while working in their fields. And he says, so, and, and he ends his report with saying, many people only escape the, escape the clutches of bandits only to rush into the mouths of tigers. And this is a line from his report. Um, let's see, in another, in another account, um, one source, and this is very laconic, it's an official government chronicle. It says, because of the long <coughs> period of disorder in the province, people replaced cattle as food. So there was no cattle being seen, there was no people. Um, it says, a peck of rice sold for 10,000 cash. Because there was nothing to eat in the wilds, when bandits spotted a person, they ate him. Because fires could be seen a great distance at night, people would sneak up and ambush and eat you. People started eating without the cooking. Um, parents, children, and spouses would make meals of their deceased relatives. And so what eventually happens is that all the people would move moved up into these mountain fortresses. Everybody it was just total like armed camps. And people would make little stockades in the mountains. And anyone comes here, you get shot. And, um, and so the, the records talk about all of the different groups are trying to take out these stockades for all these, these locals to just hold up and, and for self-defense. And the entire southwest is full of these sorts of um, things. And another account, uh, this is from the late 1650s, uh, the Qing troops are coming into Sichuan, and he said, um, the commander says, the, troop, the war ravaged land is filled with nothing but ghost towns. Corpses and bones are strewn along the road, and only mountain flowers grew. And uh, the only sound emanating from the leaves of the houses were the sounds of wild birds. And um, you know, so there are a lot of these sort of uh, accounts you know, through, the, through the 1650s and 
60. I mean, you just want them to blame the other side for this. But it's really a combination of I should say there are some positive accounts. Um, once the peasant rebels, once Don Shandong dies, the peasant rebels take over an area farther south, and they supposedly restore law and order, and, and, and especially one guy named Li Jingwa, I'm going to see his image in a minute. But supposedly they get along so well with the people that they were harsh, but the people loved them and they loved the people. And things were so secure that even dogs and chickens walked the streets without fear. <laughs> because if you killed a dog or a chicken, the rebels would kill you. Um, you know, somebody accidentally killed a baby, and so that guy was executed. You know, another guy got drunk and killed an old lady, and he was executed. Um, so there were all these, these accounts of, you know, more positive things. I guess they generally end in execution, too. But there are, there are positive elements that the, the peasants are <coughs> um, So I have a few more images here. I kind of wrap things up. This is actually the sword of a female warrior, a uh, local aboriginal chieftainess who became prominent defending her village and her area from the peasant rebels, a woman named Chin Liang Yu. And interestingly enough, parts of her uniform, which I didn't know, made it into the official uniforms of the Beijing Olympics, parts of her armor and stuff. I'll show you her helmet in a minute. And I had no idea about this. She was also <coughs> she was on the cover of cigarettes in the 1930s. Like the cigarette company made the Chin Liang Yu cigarettes. So um, you know, there's this whole display on her in the Sichuan Provincial Museum. So just that's her sword. This is her helmet. I, I, I have pictures of her armor and stuff too, but I don't have the sword on. This is a cannon used to defend Chongqing from Dong Shantung. Uh, the Ming era cannon. These are more coins. These are Ming Imperial, the Ming Royalist Court coins during the Empress. <coughs> so that's Dong Shantung's coin again. Sent to the West. And um, so in terms of what it meant for the people as a whole, I think I've covered a lot of this already, so I won't go too much. But destruction of families, in particular in this Confucian context, the inability to bury your ancestors, to bury your relatives, and to honor them, to recover the bodies, is so traumatic. So you read these accounts of these people, like their parents who died, they couldn't find them. Or their children were lost, they couldn't find them. And the inability to you know, bring the body together to bury it, to perform the proper Confucian rituals and their belief system if the body is not properly interred, it wanders for eternity as a ghost. And um, and if it's not if it's not all you know even interred together, like with the arms and stuff are cut off and separated, similar things will happen. And so you have these you know, these very poignant accounts of the destruction of families, you know, fathers and sons, you know, mothers, you know, these and it's and it's interesting to see some of the filial stuff too, like some of the women whose husbands are like, I'll join the bandits, and the wife's like, You may join the bandits, but I'm not gonna sully my name, and they kill themselves. <laughs> to, to defend the family honor. Um, so you see that. You see the disruption of agriculture for uh, you know, many, many years, some places worse than others. But they talk about the uh, tax revenue and the uh, problems there. And that's what leads to famine and disease, you know, malnutrition to some degree, the destruction of the animal population, the destruction of the plant population. And one of the things the bandits do when they move to the south is they will enlist the people in gathering food for them and firewood and stuff for their armies. In fact, they take the little kids. And that's their job. Like when they take all the kids under 12, you got to go gather firewood and food for us. And then the older ones are either killed or castrated. Um, and so they, you know, they, you know, this, is, this is sort of how they maintain order. Um, the discussion of uh, tigers, which I talked about, and other predators. And this in Chinese culture also means you know, Sabbath is chaos. You know, the government can't control things. And so depending on the source, when the Qing finally restored order, you know, then suddenly the tiger attacks stop. Mention the militarization a little bit. Uh, the entire society comes in armed camp. Everybody is switching sides, and um, you know it's, it's you know really confusing to read, but really interesting to see how you know people band together and for self-preservation. And then there's this this discussion of trauma and how people remember these accounts and you know, the bloodshed and the, the stories. And they talk about the smells. And you know, one city they said you know the corpses were so high and the, the ground four inches. Of One of the things I'm going to do in the book that I don't talk about today is I'm actually looking at trauma studies in the modern sense and looking at memory and sort of bringing some of those insights into the discussion and analysis of this material, which will be hopefully fruitful. We'll see. Um, so this is my, my favorite character in Chinese history, Li Jingguo. This is Zhang Shanzhong's uh, son, adopted son, and he's a guy.
guy who comes in as the main boy on this channel, who defends them to the very end, eventually dies of disease in Kaya after the last one emperor is killed. But he's, he's renowned as a hero today because he switched back to the main because he couldn't stand the shame of being abandoned, according to the primary sources. And, um, you know, and, and then, you know, fights the Qing to the bitter end, you know, defeats, kills two Qing princes, actually, at one point. And, um, you, know, and you know, is a, is a hero today, and there's even a chicken dish named after him in South China, the Yu Li Ding Wa Chicken. It's pretty tasty. My wife made it. We found the recipe on the internet and made a, the, the, the Prince Jin Chicken. So just uh, in, in terms of final stuff, and I've talked about this already, so I'm not going to rehash, but the idea of perspectives, the notion of chaos and disorder, the notion of loyalty, and you know, sort of how modern uh, historians have used these for their, own, uh, for their own agendas, and finally some of the universal elements of suffering, uh, memory, and uh, social disorder are some of the key themes I want to touch on. Southern Ming forces in particular, that guy Li Dingwa, he's renowned for his use of guns, for his use of small arms and cannon, and they actually talk about them a lot. I mean, there, there's extensive use of firearms. And so the people in the stockades have them, the peasant rebels have them, the Manchus have them a little less. In fact, they have fewer because they're mounted archers. That's their favorite method of warfare. So they had guns, but they, they didn't use them actually quite as much as the Ming forces did, the peasant rebels. And so, and like when they capture cities and stuff, that's one of the things they always say, we capture X number of guns, this much gunpowder. And when the when the peasant rebel regimes then get into establish their own sort of government in southwest China, one of the big things they do is mine saltpeter and get gunpowder and set up these factories to manufacture guns. So yeah, so yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty prominent actually. And they, they had more than the, the Manchus did in Asia. Yeah, they had more fewer than Manchus. So yeah, but yeah, they, you see the cannons there. You don't there are still a few of the smaller guns in Chinese a contemporary observation and then we'll go back to your historical uh, reports. In the images that you took, was the air that bad in China? Because as I looked at things, it seemed like it was really, really uh, thick air. You know, the, the background wasn't real real clear. In um, that was it's fine. Okay. Um, the Beijing, yeah, Beijing, I didn't think it was too bad this year. Okay. I, I guess I'm used to it. There's nothing, nothing invigorates you like Beijing pollution. <laughs> the, the, it is interesting, like when you drive down the road, like all the trees are covered in dirt. There's like dust and dirt, like thick, like nothing is actually green. And I just roll with it because I'm used to it. But um, but everything is pretty dirty. Um, but out out where out like where John died, that area is pretty clean. It's pretty well. It's country, uh, and you can see the sky was relatively blue there, and not in the bigger cities you see that. You know, there's a lot of smog and pollution. It's better than. And then the second thing was, uh, you touched in your introduction about the mini ice age and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. In the images that you showed from the museum and from the literature, uh, in my mind, they seem to be wearing more winter clothes and stuff like that. Is there a connection there, or is that just you know, artistic license? Um, I don't know if that was a conscious decision, but certainly <coughs> when, when reading accounts, they talk about this in the accounts. I mean, they've been called the mini ice age, but they talk about some of this poor harvests and, and the, um, the cold weather, the droughts. And there's a lot of drought, too. And they talk about drought a lot, especially in Sichuan. Um, now, in Yunnan, later, they, did, they talk about good harvests and, and warm weather and stuff. So it, it, it wasn't constant. But, but from 1600, I think that, if, if I recall the stats, from 1600 to 1640 was the coldest four-decade period in, in Chinese history that like they could, they could chronicle based on you know, tree rain. The scholar Jeffrey Parker did a book a couple of years ago, a massive like thousand page book called Global Crisis, and he 
compares the entire world of experience. So if you got a lot of time and 30 bucks, you can buy it on Amazon. <laughs> That's who he has to sell it. But yeah, I mean, it, it, there, there is some discussion. And it's funny because now modern Chinese scholars are, are teasing on that and talking about that as if it's you know, a fact that is apparently wrong. It's just quite frequently wrong. Did you run any? Decades later, like the Qing find out he's still alive, and he had been living like a month or something, and they kill him. Um, but, and he's like eighty some years old, and they're like, "Yeah, you're you're a Ming, you're a Ming guy." Um, what happens with the, with the people that become the Ming loyalist um, emperors? They are all like the nephews or cousins of that last emperor. And in fact, the, one of the most yeah, the one who becomes the first emperor, one of them or one of these princes. There's all this controversy about him earlier in life because he was <coughs> Lisa Chung. He was playing the game that he takes the princess capital. Chang Chen Dong killed a bunch of them too. It's like his personal mission to kill Ming princes. He probably killed at least a half a dozen of them. Yeah. And I then he moved into their house. When he took over Chang he moved into their house. <coughs> I have a related question. Just when you were talking about how he killed his daughter and then chopped off her arm and then she ended up uh, uh, in the uh, monastery. I mean, was there no reason to try and save the daughters? Like, and send them into hiding? Like, why is he sending the princess into hiding and not the daughters? I mean, is there a more complex answer than just, like, patriarchy? <coughs> um, the, the, the daughters, well, the daughters were not really seen, and uh, basically the, the main reason to kill the daughters is so they aren't raped. And they're not seen as, I mean, it's not seen as politically useful to him at this point to kind of try to keep them alive so that somebody else can marry them. They're just not seen as valuable anymore. So they're not going to carry on no, the daughters aren't going to yeah. carry on the lineage. Nope. Yeah. So, sorry for the... <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Yeah. So the sons despair, and it's funny because the one son, supposedly, when he meets Lisa Chung, he's like, just bury my parents, you know, treat them well. I don't care what you do to me. And then the other one is pretty young. He's like six or seven or something. And, and Lee is, uh, I don't think he actually kills them. Uh, they were hiding with an uncle. Even at the end, there was a chance that Lee was going to let the emperor live, but he just <laughs> fiefed him as a prince, and then you know, the, Ming, the Ming emperor didn't buy that. He just built the body and killed himself. And that actually has made him a better historical figure. As bad as he was as a ruler, people like, you know, at least you didn't cave. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not? 